Hi and welcome back to a new video. If you might remember in 2020 November we did a video about the EK tech cooler. This was a cooperation with Intel. So Intel came up with the idea. It's not a new idea. Tech elements have been around before. Peltier elements, so tech cooling. And Intel thought they would use te this technology to get higher boost frequency on 10900K CPUs to achieve better scores in benchmarks. Basically to be on top of the chart again. To a high price because those tech elements or techs, they come with a cost of very high power consumption. I'm not even sure if these coolers were a success back then. That's why I was quite surprised when EK launched the Quantum Delta 2 Tech mid this year. I bought it back then, it's like four months ago. I planned to use it with the 12900K, but, it, but I didn't have time to do so. I paid 560 euro for this cooler. And according to the EK website, this should be an improved version of this. So this was purely using or following the Intel guidelines, I think. So this entire part made on top right here was the Intel controller. And then on the bottom, we just had an EK cooler. Basically with the tech sitting in between a cold plate that would transfer the heat from the CPU to the tech. And then the tech would transfer the heat, well, through the tech and then to the cold plate to the water. The tech used back then was using normal aluminium oxide, so those should have thermal conductivities of around 30 to 40 watt per meter Kelvin. And at least according to the EK website, the new one should use aluminium nitride. That should be much better thermal conductivity, about 160 to 108 watt per meter Kelvin typically. So that alone and also the fact that they claim to have soldered the tech to the cold plate. That should definitely improve the efficiency of this product. Even though in the end physics are still physics, so they will not get around that a tech will have a high power consumption. And they say peak power consumption of this will be 210 watt, which also tells us that we cannot dissipate the heat of a 13900K under full load because this exceeds 300 watt. And that's definitely far outside the range of what the tech inside here would be capable of. But we also showed in the launch video that the typical power consumption of the 3900K in gaming is somewhere between 70 to 120 watt. And the tech should definitely be capable of cooling this. So that should be quite interesting. I'm not even sure if the software is compatible with C790, but we will find it out. Hetzner is a leading hosting provider and data center operator in Europe with hundreds of thousands of servers in operation. By combining its strengths in innovative technology, attractive prices and expert customer service, Hetzner expanded its marketing both within and outside Europe. They operate their very own high-tech data centers in Nuremberg and Falkenstein, both located in Germany and in Helsinki, Finland. Hetzner not only provides high performance cloud servers at an affordable price, but also incredibly powerful dedicated servers capable of handling any project. Aside from these products, you can also get high quality storage products and a variety of other services. Click on the link below to dive into Hetzner's portfolio. That was the previous version of the tech cooler, an early prototype, that's why it's also not nickel plated. That was the cold plate, so that's taking up all the heat from the CPU. In between here we had the tech, the Peltier element, also the cables for connection for power supply of the tech and above the cold plate that is responsible for dissipating both the heat of the CPU and the tech combined. On top the black thing here that was just the control unit. Now this thing even though it looks like an EK block is just the control unit. Basically what we had sitting on top right here. Always have to check if Makita is doing some bad stuff. Let's take the CPU for now. Because cats are always known for dropping things and she should not drop the 13900K. Going back to our control unit of the Delta. I was first unsure if it's just using the same thing in a new housing because previously this was directly attached to the cooler and this updated version allows to just mount this conveniently on a 120 millimeter fan spot inside your case. That's what this adapter here is for. Definitely is going to be much more aesthetic. And what I also noticed is that this one has two temperature sensors. It has H and C, basically hot and cold. 
Going back to the previous version, we only had one temperature sensor on the bottom, this one. And it was only responsible for measuring the like cold plate temperature, like the cold side of the tech, basically to prevent any kind of condensation in your system. You would typically want to stay a few degrees underneath room temperature, but not too much. And this way you could tune it to have no condensation if possible. And on the new controller, we have HNC, hot and cold. And this way you can not only check for condensation, but also for the hot side of the tech, because just theoretically speaking, if you're not capable or able to cool the tech well enough, it could also destroy itself. So I just guess that this is for better regulation of the tech. Apart from that, we still have an 8-pin connector. I think it was an EPS connector, not a graphics card connector, but I will check that again. And in the center, right here in the back, like all the way down there, we have another black connector and that's for power supply of the tech. And the new Delta II tech definitely looks much better than the predecessor and it's also very sleek. There is not much to say about this. If you turn it around, you will find again some like rubber seal, rubber gasket that surrounds the cold plate of the cooler. It's to seal off this part from your mainboard. It just it should just sit right on top of the PCB and this way lead to no or like less condensation. We will see how that works out. I don't want to open it up right now. We might do that later after we did the test. And as I pointed out before, we have two connection cables for hot and cold temperature sensors and this power connector right here and also RGB. I was just about to put the Delta onto the 13900K, which is already sitting in the socket of this Asus Extreme board. But as you can see, if I just want to place it the way it's intended, you can see this is going to be literally extremely tight. I think this way it's probably not going to fit. Then I thought about rotating this by 90 degree, which theoretically would fit, as you can see. So that should be a possibility to mount the block. But then again, we have this insulation thing underneath and that is not going to fit. I will probably now try to unmount this thing right here and try if I can just rotate this by 90 degree. With the four screw removed, I could easily take off this quite thick insulation foam, or it's not a foam, it's like a, a piece of rubber, like this gasket thing. And underneath, now we can also take a look at the cooler, which looks definitely quite interesting. Also, if you look into the side, you can see that it's not, at least from what I can tell, one single tech, but seems to be four in total. I'm not sure if they're soldered or not, at least it's very hard to tell, it could be. Would also explain why the bottom one is copper, because that should make soldering quite a lot easier. Would also explain why we can see some like different coloring between like this area and this area of the copper. Could be due to some flux or just heating it up, would definitely already cause a different coloring to the copper. And I think for now, I will try to rotate this and if it doesn't work, I will just try it without the gasket. Oh well, I just noticed that it has a very distinctive shape inside, which would only allow this thing to be mounted in one single direction. So no rotation possible means we're just going to mount it without the gasket. I also changed to our contact frame right now, because especially for this purpose, if you're hunting for the last few degrees Celsius, if we would miss four, five, six degrees on this would definitely be a waste. And I'm also going to use these G-Skill Trident C6800 C34 memory modules that should also give the 13900K another performance bump. I put the cooler on with its own weight, didn't screw it down just to see if we have a good contact, but that should work out just fine. Now I'm going to reapply the paste and we can start working on the mounting from the backside of the board. The mounting is meant to use this like rubber piece first and then you should stick this EPDM piece. It's like a soft insulation sheet. You sh you're meant to stick this on there like this and then put the back plate on top. But I'm not quite sure how sticky this is and I don't want to ruin my motherboard right now and that's why we'll just go without it. Sorry that I have to complain again, but I'm not sure who thought that this mounting is a good idea because there's literally no space. You just cannot like, I'm supposed to tighten this here and this here, but there's no way I can reach anything down there. We'll have to use some pliers for that. At least we managed to finish this part. The cooler is now sitting on the board. 
fits nice only without the insulation gasket. Since the power consumption and also the thermal dissipation will be quite insane using the Peltier element inside the EK block, we will also need insane cooling power. That's why I finally decided to assemble my Mora. I think I bought this over a year ago, just didn't have time, didn't have the opportunity to do it. Equipped it with some Arctic fans, simply because it doesn't have to look nice, it will just sit underneath the table. We'll have to perform and it will have to be quiet and that's exactly what these fans are great for. And well, now also fill it with the Apex liquid from Alpha Cool. Also got this for a completely different project, never used it before. Also very good opportunity for me to test this liquid inside here. The EK Delta tag should be ready to go. Controller is completely attached. We have USB connection, the temperature probe connection, connection to the tag and also the 8-pin power connector. So it's just a normal 8-pin PCIe, it's not EPS. And on here, the block, it's all good to go. I just checked if everything is sealed, if like no leaks appear. All looks good from my side. And now we will have to find out if the software is compatible to the 13th gen, because at least according to the product website, both on EK and Intel, it only supports up to Intel 12th gen. I don't see why it wouldn't support the 13th gen, but there could always be like an artificial software lock. At least nothing exploded, so far so good. On the controller, I think we can see a red LED inside. I remember seeing that also on the previous version. I guess we will just have to run the software. One thing I quickly want to note about the Maximus Extreme, even though I really like the board, it's a nice board, it has a ton of features, and that is probably the worst feature. Like. Asus, why did you think it's a good idea to put some weird casing around the debug LED whenever you're like a bit to an angle, you're not able to read it anymore. You have to be perfectly in line with it. Otherwise, if you look a bit to the side, from the bottom, from the top, you cannot see anything. What a stupid idea. Unfortunately, as expected, the software is not compatible yet with the 13th gen CPUs. That was kind of as expected because just going by the software listing on the Intel website, it's only stating support for up to 12th gen. Also, this version is from August when 13th gen was not out yet. Then I reached out to my Intel contacts. I asked them, so what's up with the 13th gen and the cryo cooler? They said it's going to be compatible, but right now there seems to be still some kind of bug inside the software, at least in combination with the 13th gen. So they're still working on it. And they said that it will take a bit more time until they can send the software to me to use it. And then I said, you can send the software anyway, or otherwise I will just put up a system right next to it with 12th gen. And that's why I'm right now waiting for a reply, either to get a software or we will simply set up a 12900K right next to it and use it anyway and just put the USB cable from there to here. Isn't this a tiny and very sweet, cute looking management system for our cryo cooler. It's a C690 based motherboard mini ITX using of course boxed cooler for a 12900KS. Single memory dim should be fine just to run Windows and the cryo cooler software. Already have an SSD installed with Windows 11 on it and also some portable monitor to it. And I also attached a portable monitor to it. I absolutely love these right now for debugging or if I just need like a separate system. Very convenient to have these. That looks promising. Right now it tells me to connect the cooler via USB. At least the software is installed. It's running in standby. And if I enable cryo mode, it tells me success. And then a few seconds later, it tells me, let's see if the error message pops up again. Standby mode. Apparently because I did not connect fan and pump. Why is this necessary? Why do I have to connect this? Cooler is running. Fan error is detected. Please check your fan connection. Water pump error is detected. Please check your water pump connection. I already wondered before why there is like FNP on there. Seems to be fan and pump and it seems to be required to power these over the controller, which is very inconvenient. I'm not sure why this is needed. Because like in my case, I'm running an external Mora, which is much more powerful than anything you would have inside a system. That is quite weird. And indeed confirmed the controller requires a pump 
and fan to be connected in order to run the software without an error. Luckily, we're living in 2022 and you can be whatever you want to be, whoever you want to be. And also our Intel box cooler identifies now as a pump. And the second box fan which we're using, it's already a fan, so just, just identifies as a fan. And now you can see our pump and the cooling fan is working as intended. Obviously, the controller has no idea what kind of device you would connect to it. That's why just any kind of fan signal would trigger it to believe that the pump is connected or like a fan is connected, but just, just connect anything to it and it's fine. I also find it very entertaining how often this error message pops up and it doesn't close itself. So if you don't do anything, you can see it just opens like a hundred of windows. But now, as you can see, that fan and pump are working as intended. We can finally, oops, switch on the cryo mode. And I still think that the cryo mode is a, it's a brilliant thing. It's very elegant because if you just pay attention to this, you can see that currently, because I just switched it on, power is quite high for a minute until the cooler is reaching the designated temperature, which is set by the dew point. And that is calculated by the temperature sensor that sits in the controller. And that basically depends on your room temperature. It's not that warm in here right now, so dew point at 14 degrees Celsius makes sense, which allows the cooler to sit at 15 degrees Celsius without risking condensation. That's awesome. I just wanted to switch over to the different system, to the 13900K system, but now this pops up, error DT1, no idea what it is. I reset the software and enabled again the cryo mode seems to be working at least for the moment you can see the temperatures are in a great area. We went as low as 13 degrees celsius on one core. Those are temperatures you would never be able to achieve with any kind of like water cooling at least at room temperature. And yeah, we're running the 13900K, it's just idle right now so no load that's also why those temperatures are very very nice. I will now spend some time and adjust the system like the thermal velocity boost and all things like that. And I'm very curious what kind of clocks and temperatures we will see in gaming. This is the reason why I love thermal velocity boost and the opportunities or the configuration possibilities you have on these CPUs. You can see depending on the amount of cores that are loaded, depending on the temperature, the CPU is currently clocking somewhere between 6 and 6.2 gigahertz, sometimes going down to 5.8. That's the security margin I have built in with the settings right now. So it's still an early test I'm doing right now. Temperature wise, you can see most of the cores are sitting at about 20 degrees Celsius while not loaded. And the single threaded core, if loaded, is peaking out as you can see somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. But also if we check out the load, we are hitting between 60 and 80 watt package power. And that is also the region which you should expect while gaming. Maybe sometimes also 90 or 100 watts depending on the game. But the load on a single core while gaming is definitely lower. It's spread across multiple cores. That's why the temperature in gaming should also be lower. I think I will also repeat this with hardware info and CPUZ closed and see what kind of single threaded boost or single threaded clock we can get. And that's just insane. That's just an insane score, 941. Essentially, this is still ambient cooling. Of course, the memory with 6800C34 will do its part in there, but still, this is running like 6.1 to 6.2 gigahertz. And that's where you get this performance from. And to get a feel of how much performance this means, stock you should achieve between 830 to 850 points. Apart from the Cinebench R20 single run, which you just saw, we also performed three gaming benchmarks. To just see how much more performance we can squeeze out of the system by running the CPU above 6 GHz. And we are starting with PUBG, where you can see some in-game footage right now. I also want to point out that this was captured running OBS which means that you're losing a bit of FPS with the 4090, but the load on the CPU does not increase. And that's also why the CPU still performs extremely well. 
The temperatures on the CPU during gaming are typically somewhere between 30 to 50 degrees Celsius. And this allows the 13900K to constantly boost to 6.2 gigahertz. Once in a while it exceeds the threshold, which was defined by me, of 68 degrees Celsius, which causes the CPU to clock down to 6.1 gigahertz, which is still absolutely insane. But the CPU also requires additional voltage to be stable at these clocks. And I defined an offset of plus 170 millivolt to achieve these clocks. And even though the offset sounds a bit high, you have to keep in mind that the temperatures are pretty low and same goes for the load itself. Similar as with our 13900K launch review, you can see the average FPS now in yellow and the power consumption average in blue. We are starting with PUBG in WQHD. The 3900K stock already performs quite well here with 625 FPS and pulls below 100 Watt. With our solid overclocking of 6.2 GHz using the cryo cooler, we can increase the performance by 7% to 668 FPS. However, this also causes the CPU to pull quite a bit more power. The power consumption increases by 27%. In Far Cry 6 running 1080p resolution, we can also utilize the overclocking to increase the performance by additional 10 FPS. But this only means additional 5%, while the power draw increases by 18%. In Battlefield 2042 we can see a similar, rather low increase of performance. The reason for this is that Battlefield 2042 and also to some degree Far Cry 6 causes higher load on the CPU, which you can see by the power draw, which is 152 watt. That also means that the CPU is running a little bit hotter and therefore the CPU clocks a bit lower because it exceeds the threshold and therefore it only clocks between 5.8 to 6 gigahertz. This allows a performance increase of 6% and a power consumption increase by 21%. Overall, the cryo cooler just delivers. It's insane how well this can cool the 3900K and it's also insane how high the 3900K can clock under good conditions like lower temperatures. I think that's also why Asus was able to reach another world record by validating the 3900K at 8.8 gigahertz. That's quite insane. Also, if you keep in mind that the previous gen, the 12900K, it would not even run these kind of clocks under dry ice conditions. And now we can we can run over six gigahertz pretty much on ambient. And if you also keep in mind that the 12900 KS is probably coming in a few months, I don't know what kind of clocks you would get with a cryo cooler, maybe 6.3, 6.4, just, just completely mind blowing. But there are some things to it, to the cryo cooler, they definitely have to improve. And even though we were running it on the 12900K system, it was not running perfectly smooth because it should run perfectly smooth on a 12900KS. The cooler has no idea that we're running it on the 13900K. And that's why I would expect not to get these weird software bugs, like the DT1 error, which is very annoying. I'm not sure why, like every 15 minutes, this DT1 pops up, but it's just very annoying. And what is even more annoying is that the software always resets itself. Like you always have to manually enable the cryo mod again. It's like, it's, it's like, too safe. I'm not sure how to say it. It's like whenever something just slightly goes wrong, it directly disables itself instead of just trying to maybe run the cryo mod again. But that's not the case. The default mode should not be disabled. It makes no sense. You want to have it enabled. And if something goes wrong, if something fails, like if there's a hard failure, then maybe go into the like switch the tech off mode. But it has to always run in cryo mode on default. That's what I would assume. Pricing wise, I mean, it's like 600 euro. That's definitely not cheap, but I mean, we're running this on a board that costs over 1000 euro. We're running a 13900K, which is not cheap. And we're running a 4090. I'm not sure if I would recommend buying these components, but I can just say it's a lot of fun playing with them, like literally, and also the performance is just, it's just insane. I also talked to Intel again, checked about the software and they said they will send a 13900K test software to me, which is not quite ready for launch yet, but they said it will be ready quite soon. And then it's definitely quite fun to play with the cryo cooler, but they have to improve the software. They have to improve it. It's not a bad software. I've seen much worse, but there's definitely room for improvement. We will probably check it again once the software is final, maybe once the 13900KS is out. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.